May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, strength, redeemer. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Well, good morning to you. Uh, my name is Dorothy White, and I am serving as interim chaplain, head chaplain at Breck School. And Katie Ernst is currently serving as the middle school chaplain, and she will be the head chaplain at Breck School beginning in the fall. <laughs> we share an office together right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> with a bunch of uh, little three and four year olds who always bang on the window and wave. <laughs> and in our time being together, we talked about this event. I did not know about it. Uh, I came to Minnesota two years ago. Last winter, I began to ask the Lord, did I upset him? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> uh, so this winter has been quite different. Thanks, be to God. <laughs> <laughs> so in our time together, we talked, and I knew that Katie knew Barbara Harris. And even though my students laugh when I tell them I was born in the last century, since Anna Julia Cooper was born in 1858, I did not know Anna <laughs> Julia Cooper, okay? But Anna Julia Cooper has special significance that I will share in just a moment. So in our talking together, we decided what we're going to do today, I will be sharing about Anna Julia Cooper, that she will be my focus, and Katie will share with you some incredible stories about the incredible Barbara Harris, who some of you I know had a chance to meet and know. So we are here to share a message that needs to be shared with multiple voices. I think we make a mistake when we zero in on who can and cannot have a say, and yet Though we came over, as Dr. King put it, we came over on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. <laughs> and so since we are, we need to talk yeah. with one another better than we are doing. But we also need to hear from one another. Each of our experiences gives credence to our own stuff, and it does. We've been through it. But we've come together to commemorate two amazing sisters who lived in different times and yet in so many ways faced the same thing. We read in Isaiah's words that the prophet talked about being a repairer of the breach, a restorer of the streets. We hear the words of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, empowered me. Does that not imply opposition? Why be empowered if there's not going to be opposition? Mm -hmm. And so these women knew to some degree what was coming. I shared in the last service, having been born in 1954 and been part of a number, numbers of people who integrated schools, what my parents did for us, this, my first experience was sixth grade. My three sisters and brother, they had their own experiences. But each evening we came home from these schools, we had dinner, and we got healed. And we had dinner, and we were healed. So by the next morning, all doubts about my value were gone. I later in life began to realize that deconstruction during the day and reconstruction in the evening was the slave quarters. And no doubt it was Anna Julia Cooper and no doubt it was Barbara Harris. 
So Anna Julia Cooper was born in 1858 in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she was, excuse me, she was born into slavery. The incredible thing about this woman was she recognized the need for education. She recognized the value of it. An educated mind, hear this young folks, I know you get tired of reading, but hang in there anyhow. An educated mind cannot be oppressed, as Nelson Mandela. An educated mind cannot be oppressed. So she recognized this, and as she pursued her education, she ran into this. So she's at a school, and all the students are black, but because she's a woman, she's basically told, oh, now we're not going to bother you with Greek and math and, you, you know, bless your heart. <laughs> and she petitioned and won her right to learn those very disciplines because an educated mind cannot be oppressed. So for the rest of her life, she was in education. And she lived until she was 105 years old and died in Washington, D.C. after having been a principal of Dunbar High School. She earned her doctorate at 67 at the University of Paris. Excuse a personal moment. You go, woman. <laughs> so she did. <clears throat> now, I want to mention to you two quotes that very much typify Anna Julia Cooper. First quote, all prejudices, whether of race, sect, or sex, class pride and cash distinctions, any of those reasons, are the belittling inheritance and badge of snobs and pricks. <laughs> Did she speak her mind? <laughs> Second quote, if women were once permitted to read Sophocles and the works of logarithms and if they could nibble at the side of the apple of knowledge, there would be an end forever to their sewing on buttons and embroidering slippers. <laughs> she knew that she was not relegated based on her sex. Mm -hmm. She could sit and sew on buttons if she wanted to, but that was not her only option because an educated mind cannot be oppressed, even in Robben Island. I just want to say before I speak on Barbara Harris, uh, the courage and maybe foolishness of having two pe preachers this morning. Um, <laughs> but it's good. It's good to be with you, Reverend White. So in, in 1989, preaching at St. Bartholomew's in the weeks leading up to her consecration as the first bishop in all of the Anglican Church to be a woman and a black woman, Bishop Harris preached these words to that congregation, which is a historically black congregation. She said, many of our churches must recognize that solemn masses and other high church rituals, sometimes interspersed with some gospel music for soul, are fine, but liturgy alone will not bring in the kingdom of God. And our incense offerings are an abomination to the Lord when people outside our doors are denied. And a thousand genuflections cannot atone for the injustice that goes unchallenged. We cannot afford the sinful luxury of private feuds and public fusses. There is much work to be done and too few who are willing to do it. And while we nitpick, over inconsequential items, the real issues go unaddressed and unattended. Our energies must be applied to serving God's people, not engaging in power plays, or who's going to run the show, my gang or your gang. This is precisely what I love 
about Bishop Harris. Even while being mired in the patriarchal white political power plays of our beloved Episcopal Church, Bishop Harris kept true to God's call on her life and reminded God's children and the church where our eyes must be set upon the loving, liberating, and life-giving face of Jesus. In 1989, I was just two months past my fourth birthday during her consecration as a bishop. And she was sitting in Heinz Convention Center in Boston, Massachusetts, surrounded by 8,500 people and 60-plus bishops, which is probably the most bishops that have ever come together for consecration. And a police escort sat beside, behind her. And actually before the service, they asked if she wanted a bulletproof vest. And she declined it. And she said, if any fool wants to kill me, what better place to die than on the altar? And there was a handful of people who contested her legitimacy as a priest, let alone a bishop. I don't think my family at the time in South Dakota even clocked what was happening uh, in Boston. <laughs> And little did I know that 22 years later, when I was around 26 years old, I'd be riding up a diocesan elevator with Bishop Harris as she humbly introduced herself as Barbara and probably told some outrageous story that had us all cracking up in the elevator. I got to spend a little over eight years working alongside Bishop Harris, who was retired by the time that I got to her. And whether it was walking beside the red convertible as she rode in it during the pride parade, or when she let me wear her mitre at the diocesan convention, or showing up at the Mother's Day Walk for Peace, denouncing gun violence and harm done to young black men, or the countless times I got to hear her tell stories from her life and ministry, usually leaving us all in an uproar or laughter. If you didn't know, Bishop Harris was quick to deliver some pretty good one-liners. Um, I would repeat some of them, but I, at last, am not Bishop Harris, and I would get in trouble, for sure. Uh, when I met Bishop Harris, I didn't know who she was or the significance of her ministry. At the time, I barely knew what an Episcopalian was, um, I, having been raised in South Dakota as a good old Lutheran. And after that first elevator ride with her, I ran home to the intentional community that I was in. And I just sort of casually mentioned to one of my housemates, I said, yeah, I met this little old lady, you know, she's like five foot tall, um, sort of scrabby. And she said to me, she, she was saying some funny things, we're cracking up, and someone referred to her as a bishop. Um, and my housemate was like, uh, stop, the Bishop Barbara Harris you met the first woman bishop in all of the Anglican communion, and embarrassment, of course, fell over me right away um, for the little that I knew of my ignorance. And I'm a little ashamed to admit that even after knowing this about her, I still didn't grasp the magnitude of her impact or the brilliance of her life and the fortitude and resilience that she so beautifully and strongly embodied and what she was teaching to me at that time about Jesus and about spirituality. It has only been since her death in 2020 and my own ordination into the priesthood that I have taken the time to really unpack what she was teaching me about God and resilience and love. In the months leading up to her consecration as a bishop, she was really put through it. She received death threats accusations of misconduct and unfitness because of her previous divorce that she had. Her intelligence and credibility were put on trial because she didn't have the proper degrees. And her lack of experience as a rector only been ordained for about nine years put, her, put a doubt about, around her ability to be a bishop. And of course, her gender was with a sizable helping of racism rounded out the onslaught of the opposition. This happened before she was a bishop, and it continued into her life as a bishop. Churches refused to have her visit to do confirmations. Even the diocesan bishop at the time, who publicly supported her, privately undermined her authority and relegated her to the work at the cathedral. 
even going as far as telling the next elected diocesan bishop that he should just get rid of her because she doesn't do any good work in the diocese. Whiteness and patriarchy runs pretty deep, my friends. One thing that Bishop Harris didn't lack was a stubborn resolve to know who she was and more importantly, whose she was. Sure, she spoke really bluntly to power structures and systems of oppression, but she concerned herself more with serving God's children and showing up to people and the places that needed to hear a good word. She knew where her authority came from, and it did not come from the role of being a bishop or from the approval of other people or society. It came from God, who she knew as her liberator, known best through Jesus of Nazareth. Bishop Harris could have spent her ministry with all her energy and her eyes set upon just only focusing on those who oppressed her, trying to convince them to change their ways, or she could have tirelessly tried to just change people's minds about, about women in the church. Or worse, she could have just gone the other way and just made herself small and quiet, not causing a fuss. And this is what I love about her and so admire and what she's continuing to teach me today. Instead of doing that, she let her life speak truth to power. She echoed the words of the prophet Isaiah. She went out and proclaimed the good news about Jesus, who set the captive free and gives sight to the blind and freedom to the press. She trusts in God's promise to guide her continually and to satisfy her needs in parched places and making her bones strong. And as I enter my fifth year of ordination, I feel like a baby priest still, <laughs> and stepping into a large role coming up here in the fall, I have at various times wondered if my own marginalities of being queer and trans are truly welcomed in the church or they're just publicly applauded but privately denounced. Or if I have a place in an institution, or do I want a place in an institution that has done so much harm throughout the centuries? Or what authority do I have to live into the fullness of who I am? And when I have questioned God's call on my life because of some limited purview of some people in the church or what society might have to say about me, I only got to look back or look to Bishop Harris and the ancestors who raised up the foundations for many generations and remember that my calling is ordained by God through my baptism, not by any human hands or some formalities. And maybe you too, maybe doubt your value or your worth or where your authority comes from. And I encourage you to look to Bishop Paris and Anna as well. Um, and I'm deeply grateful for them and God's providence on my life, and I'm forever indebted to their ministry. And uh, Dorothy, I wonder, um, where do we go from here? What, what do we need to leave with? One thing Bishop Harris said was this, let there be peace among us, and let us not be instruments of our own and others' oppression. I see so much potential in the world. I am not depressed. I believe our focus is different. And just because everyone has access to the microphone, it does not mean I need to listen. <laughs> it used to be called common sense. Now I just am glad whenever I see sense. <laughs> now, one of the things that I know with all of my heart that my parents gave me and I didn't realize it at the time, don't we always get it later? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. It's kind of like how God always shows up at 1159. <laughs> What is that? You know? <laughs> why, why not 11? No, 1159. What I'm finding is this. Are we as a church praying? 
or are we using our prayers as opportunities for manipulation? As if God is so ignorant that we surely must tell God what to do. As if God has no love for the world, as if God's heart does not break for us, that we would actually verbalize prayers intentionally placed to the extinction of another human being. And some of those are even in the name of Christ. So what I find is this. Those are the lessons that I was getting at the dinner table. Those are the lessons that my parents were taught at the tables in their homes. That your worth and value is not in what you do. You are made in the image and likeness of the Most High God, not Almost High God, but the Most High God. We can grow in God's image. We can grow in God's likeness as we live into the reality of loving our neighbor as ourselves. I do not ever see permission to selectively love your neighbor north or south of any border. Mm -hmm. I don't see permission to speak about a human being as though they are not human. I just don't see it. And perhaps if our hearts break with the things that break the heart of God, if we start in prayer, if we start in those moments where I'm going, Lord, this is a hard prayer. They were mean. They intentionally did this or that. This is hard. And you stay with it until you pray. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The church just won't stay in that space because that means I can be your neighbor and Katie can be your neighbor and you can't X me out or push me away from the table. My sister, one of my sisters has a business of her own and several years back, she decided to take some kids from the inner city to Myrtle Beach. We were born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee, so she was taking them to Myrtle Beach. Well, a grandmother who's, who was a dear friend of my mother cornered my sister. Now, you know, I got three grandsons. Said, yes, ma'am, they're awful young. They're too young for the trip. But, but if you don't take them to the beach, they'll never go. Oh, they'll get there. They'll, this is my sister. They'll get there. They'll get. She said, no, if you don't take them, they'll never get to go. So here she goes, five-year-old, seven-year-old, nine-year-old, under her supervision on a trip, and she's already a chaperone. So they go to Myrtle Beach. The kids are bouncing off the walls because they're seeing a beach for the first time. So they come the next morning, get everything ready. They're getting off the bus. And just when the bus pulls up to the beach, she gets ready to get up to give instruction. Well, the bus driver apparently had never seen a beach either. So he opens the door. <laughs> off go the three little boys in her charge. And they are running, and everybody's going, stop, stop. They're running straight to the ocean. Stop, stop. In other words, do these kids think this is a pool? Stop, stop. And they keep running and keep running. She's just screaming. The men on the bus are trying to run. The sand, you know how hard it is to run in sand? Well, when you're a little kid, zoop, you can really go. <laughs> so they get all the way to the edge of the water. And she just said, I was panicked. Dorothy, I didn't know what to do. They get to the edge of the water. All three of them stop. And the youngest one turns to my sister. And this is what he says. My sister's married name is Hall. Miss Hall, look what God did. Look what God did. St. John's, look what God did. And every, I 
obstacle to getting to this table, we have got to take it down so that the transforming love of God can manifest in our lives, in our prayer lives, and in our hearts. Prayer is the way, but it's got to be open.